What do you think would make you describe your life as satisfying and successful? I know, this is one of these ambitious questions, but one that was posed by researchers in a study that followed 268 men over 75 years of their lives. And the conclusion was clear. Their happiness was linked to their social relationships and friendships. That is, men with warm social relationships considered their lives successful and also lived longer, were wealthier and had more satisfying marriages. However, that was only true if the social relationships they had were of high quality. Intrigued by this research, in this episode, I invited the professor of evolutionary psychology at the University of Oxford, Robin Dunbar, to help me understand why friendships are so significant to our personal happiness and how to maintain good quality friendships. As a reminder, I'm Claudia Mitura, work psychologist and learning and development specialist, and you are listening to series three of And Happiness, a quest to explore the bold question, what makes us happy? Welcome, Robin, to And Happiness. It's lovely to see you. Pleasure to be here. As you know, I'm very much interested about uh, your research and work in terms of how friendship relates to personal happiness. I know that in your most recent book, Friends, Understanding the Power of Our Most Important Relationships, as per the title, you really suggest that the friendship are the key relationship to our happiness. So can you walk us a little bit through why is that? The single best predictor of your psychological health and well-being and your physical health and well-being, even how long you'll live into the future, is simply the number and the quality of close friends that you have. So this is not an enormous number. It really is the kind of five best friends and including close family. The more of those you have in that category and the stronger those friendships are, the healthier, the happier, the longer you live, Everything is wonderful. (laughs) Fantastic. But it makes me kind of wonder that I have lots of wonderful friends and I can definitely see how spending time with them impacts my well-being. But it's quite interesting. How does it relate then to the kind of how many years you will live? At one level, friendship really does have a beneficial effect because the things you do with friends whether it be laughter or singing or eating together, triggers the endorphin system in the brain. And one of the things the endorphin system does as a kind of byproduct, if you like, is tune up the immune system, really. So triggers the release of natural killer cells, which one of whose tasks is to find and destroy things like viruses and some cancer cells. So the things that might cause you serious discomfort or serious illness are either eliminated or reduced and so therefore you survive longer. Wow, amazing. Obviously having great friends, brilliant. I will live long and I will prosper, great. But some of uh, our friends could be a cause of some stress and misery though. Not all relationships are so going smoothly in our life. So how do you actually measure the quality of friendships? That's actually quite difficult. We have to rely on people's ratings as to how emotionally close or they feel to individual friends. That's probably the best measure. But in in the end, it's just the number of people you have that you can call on Mm -hmm. in emergencies. I mean, when your life falls apart, being able to walk down the street and bang on somebody's door and say, my life's fallen apart, give me a hug, help me out, pick me up. And, you know, your close friends are the ones that will do that. The difference here is the big contrast, if you like, is if you try that to a complete stranger in the street, the likelihood is that they'll just get their mobile phone out and phone the police or the ambulance. (laughs) 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 And, you know, that's the big contrast, if you like, that, that it's only a very small, limited number of people who are going to drop everything. And the only reason I'm willing to do that is because you are amongst my best friends let's say I mean as you go further out in the circles of friendship people will still help you out but their willingness to do so declines gradually and how much if you like inconvenience or even money they're prepared to pay to help you 
also declines. It's those five key or five-ish key best friends in the innermost circle are the ones that will just drop everything and, and rush to your help. They're the cavalry who will come riding over the hill. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I just think this is just so important also sometimes when life is tough to know that you have those people you can count on, even if you're not calling on that help. But you kind of know that there are people in the background who will do that for you. I think it's also so important. You mentioning the number five-ish. Why that number? Can we maintain more? Can we have less friendships? How does it work? The limit on the number of people that we can afford to invest a lot of time in. So on average, that's about five. We refer to this group as the support clique or sometimes as the shoulders to cry on friends. Because <laughs> to make them work in this way, you have to invest a huge amount of time. So on average every day, we devote something like two and a half hours roughly to social life, averaged over the long term, obviously not every day. Now of that two and a half hours, 40% of that time is given to just these five people. So an hour of that two and a half hours is given to these five people. And the other people you know, all the rest of your very large family huge number of friends out there scattered across the world, they get the rest. And in the outer circles, that uh, works out at their, each person is only getting about 30 seconds a day from you. Yeah, because that's the kind of challenges of the modern life, I would say, that we kind of closer because of the social media. But then we also far apart because so much is competing for our attention on a daily basis. And definitely I can see that with more responsibility, my time definitely is shrinking. And you need to be very precise who you're spending that time with. Do you have any advice of how do you maintain those friendships long term? Well, in the end, it's just making time for people. Now, I keep saying five-ish because it does vary. By personality, extroverts will have probably six or seven maybe in that category of friendship. Introverts will perhaps have three or four. The reason is simply that introverts prefer to make sure their friends really work. So they'd rather have fewer <laughs> of them and give them more time each because both introverts and extroverts have the same amount of time in life. They can't do anything about that. Whereas extroverts kind of, I think, trade on their social confidence that, you know, they just rather have more friends so that, I don't know, if Susan says, no, I can't can't spare you the time right now. They don't mind so much. They'll go and ask Jennifer instead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they're more confident that they will get a response. Whereas I think an introverts are kind of a little bit more risk averse and would rather make sure that the first person they ask is going to say yes, so that they feel more comfortable. So it's kind of, there isn't a better way of doing things. It's just, you know, what's comfortable for you to achieve in the end the same objective, which is to be sure that you know somebody is going to come and help you out. Of course, you have a lot of fun on, I hope you have a lot of fun with your friends <laughs> on the way, but that's really the bonus. So we have definitely time as one of the elements of building those friendships, the key element, because if we're not spending time with people, then clearly we're not connecting with people. But is there anything else that help us to cement good friendships? Well, mostly then it's what you do with them. So that's laughter, occasionally a bit of singing and a bit of dancing, eating together, and also telling stories and especially kind of sad emotional stories. And of course, there's a lot of physical contact as well. We, we kind of don't notice it so much because it kind of goes on in the background but we spend an awful lot of time you know sort of patting them on the shoulder and giving them a hug and stroking their arm and all these kind of things that that we do very casually without thinking and all of these activities are very important because they trigger the endorphin system in the brain and it's the release of endorphins in the brain that makes you feel bonded to the particular person you're doing this activity with and it, but it, it, in in the end that it doesn't affect uh, the quality of your relationships with even your best friend, not even your mum, if she's not present. <laughs> so if she's not present on uh, on the occasion, your relationship with that person is not changed at all. It's the person who's there that is warmed up, if you like, as a, as a friendship. 
And what about situations when we, let's say, meeting someone for the first time? So let's say we drifted apart from our relationships due to maybe not spending that high quality time and giving people attention and we're looking for new friends. So in the situation there, is there any kind of advice or research around the kind of likeness, whether who we attracted to, who can become our friends? How do we pick our friends in a first instance? Well, the answer there is much simpler, perhaps, than one might imagine. It's simply friends tend to be very similar to us. So friendships are strongest with somebody who has the same approach to life that we do. So these are what we call the seven pillars of friendship. Things like your likes and dislikes, your hobbies and interests, the kind of music you like, the kinds of jokes you like, the things about you where you, where you grew up, all these kind of things. There's about seven major dimensions here. Uh, and the more of those dimensions you share with somebody, the stronger the relationship is. So your shoulders to cry on friends in that inner circle, you'll probably tend to share perhaps six or seven of these dimensions with them. Whereas somebody who's further out in the outer limits of social networks, so people who are sort of numbers 100 to 150 in your your rankings of friends and family, you maybe will only share one or two of these dimensions. So that makes a very big difference to the quality of the friendship and the effort that both of you will then make to build and keep that friendship going over time so Mm -hmm. what seems to happen as far as we can see is that you meet somebody who looks very interesting and so you invest a lot of time in them initially and what you're doing is checking out their seven pillars and Ah. then you kind of decide on the basis of how many of the pillars match up whether to keep investing this time in them or you just let them drift down to their natural position further out in your sort of planetary orbits, is it? Where they will sit quite happily with less effort. I can now understand why uh, friends take sides, as in I definitely have situations sometimes where let's say I will have a, a bit of um, uh, argument with my husband and you go and share it um, with your friends and of course your friends are on your side agreeing with you and and it's, it's quite fascinating because, as you said, it's because they're just very similar to me. So they obviously think as me. So they obviously share my perspective on the argument, whereas my husband will probably go and share the argument he had with me with his uh, friends. And they will say that I'm completely wrong here and I'm absolutely unreasonable in this argument. So that's absolutely fascinating. And this is a general phenom- phenomenon about friendship. It's known as homophily, meaning the love of the same, basically. So our our friendships tend to be very strongly characterised by similarity. Very interesting. So just to summarise, can we repeat the seven pillars? One of those that's really important is your sex or your gender, if you prefer. That has a huge effect because 70% of women's social networks, their complete circle friends and, and extended family are uh, consist of women and only about 30 percent are men and the reverse is true for the guys so 70 uh, percent <laughs> of men's social networks are men and only 30 percent are women and in each case the 30 percent by and large are family and in-laws whom you can't do anything about <laughs> stuck <with. laughs> And this number remains extraordinarily constant from the age of five right the way through to 85. Uh, wow. It just seems to be one of the sort of things. The other major ones, it, one of them is personality. So extroverts tend to prefer extroverts in, as friends. And introverts are a little bit less discriminating, but still they tend to prefer introverts rather than extroverts. Having the same educational trajectory. So this is might be going to the same university. It might just be doing the same course. Trajectory that they've had, that learning of a particular discipline or, or, or craft, if you like, gives them something in common to talk about. Ethnicity, because ethnicity simply s- defines the community you grew up in. It's actually, what, what I would say, because I think it's actually quite interesting, ethnicity turns out to be the least kind of robust of these. So 
Mm -hmm. uh, shared overwhelms ethnicity anytime. Uh, this is the burden of both our research and, and other people's research. So it's, it's just a first pass guess at a distance. Okay, you know, I recognize your dialect. It's not my dialect. You know, <laughs> I recognize you come from somewhere else. That kind of gets overwhelmed very quickly once people get to know each other better. The others are uh, having the same hobbies and interests, having the same worldview, which is a kind of composite measure of religion, moral views, political views, that kind of mix. It's, it's your attitude to society and the world out there, as it were. Having the same musical tastes. The last one is having the same sense of jokes. If you don't understand the joke, it's going to be a difficult conversation. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but music is interesting because in our research, what we found was that sharing the same musical tastes was the best predictor of whether you thought a complete stranger would make a good friend above all the other considerations. Oh, wow. I'm surprised at that one. <laughs> Because I'll be honest, I'm just thinking about one of, you know, my best friends. And I actually have no idea if we share the kind of musical tastes even. So I'm just quite surprised that that would be one of the kind of components you would value so strongly. I, I mean, the, none of these are absolute. So, you know, you never find this, the perfect person who ticks every box exactly <laughs> down to the last detail within the box, as it were. So life is, is all about compromises. You kind of look for the best match you can. So it may well be that your this particular friend of yours it, is dreadful on the musical connection, but on everything else, you know, there's a perfect match. So, so. <laughs> So you kind of forgive them for that. That's absolutely fascinating. Love that. Okay, so just to really summarize any final practical steps for our listeners to take in relation to their friendships to really boost their happiness, what would be kind of your key advice? Oh, I think in the end, it's actually seeing people face to face. I mean, we've looked at how social media are used in maintaining friendships and, and it kind of works quite well it seems. Keep a friendship ticking over when you can't actually meet up, which is kind of a reminder, you know, I'm still thinking of you. But at the end of the day, it seems that nothing really substitutes for being able to sit across the table and stare into the whites of the eyes of the other person and reach out and give them a hug or a pat on the shoulder or what have you. These are the things that really kick in the endorphin system, that physicality. And it's being able to sit down, have a drink together, a meal together. Zoom kind of highlights this. Because Zoom works kind of okay with people you know very well because you have this long established relationship with them. But the place to meet people and, and create new relationships is really not so satisfactory. After the initial flurry of <laughs> Zoom dinners and Zoom beers, that kind of came through in the end on you know in, to most people's consciousness that after a while you've got zoom fatigue <laughs> it just just wasn't yeah. going to work and the difference i think is simply that comp you know the technology doesn't help because it's clunky or if it's text-based you know it's very slow by the time your reply comes back from the other person you've forgotten what the joke was that you told them uh, <laughs> all that interrupt the flow of the interaction but I, I think at the end of the day if you can't engage in these kind of close activities which you know we'd normally do in, in, at great length with somebody it's just not going to press the buttons satisfactorily and I think actually it's interesting because there's one feature I suspect I mean, this is just kind of casual observation. We can sit down as two old friends and really have lots of gaps in the conversation. And we don't really mind. We just sit there and think our own thoughts. But we're kind of communing like, because we know each other well. And I think that's very difficult to do something like Zoom because somehow if there's a silence, it's just too obvious and just little things like if we were in a group going out together you know to the theater or for a dinner or, or, or for a beer in the pub or something we would kind of move around and make different conversation groups mm -hmm. with people and you know you'd have a chat with two or three people and then you'd move to another group and, and perhaps you'd suddenly remember you want to have a quiet word with, with 
Peter over in the corner where nobody else can hear. And so you go over and tap him on the shoulder. You can't do that on Zoom very no. easily. Okay, so five friends, five-ish, definitely contributing lots of time. That physical face-to-face -face contact, all because of the endorphins. Looking at those seven dimensions, how much we click there to really cement our friendship. Anything else that we need to remember about friendship and happiness? Well, I... I... I think the main thing is to, to switch your mind off and go with the flow, because if you try to do these things consciously, you kind of ruin it. You have to let the kind of emotional uh, treadmill work and do its job and, and kind of go with, with what seems natural. But, but what is important in that, that context is to pick the phone up or, uh, and contact your best friends and say, let's go and have a, uh, a, a beer together or let's go and have a coffee somewhere. Because if you don't do that, the risk is they may find somebody else. <laughs> and if you don't see somebody, is they will have bumped into somebody new and discovered that actually they're, they're a, great, a great friend. Herein lies the problem, and especially with friendships. This doesn't happen quite so much with, with family relationships because they're mm. kind of held in place by this sort of spider's web of interrelationships between an extended family. But with friendships, how well that that friendship survives depending on how much time you invest in it. So if you invest less time in the friendship, it will very gradually decay and will start to decay quite quickly. You know, the estimates are it probably takes about three years or so for somebody to go from being a good friend to becoming just an acquaintance. So it's a lot steady, slow decline. And, and herein lies the value, of course, of, of social media is what we think is happening is it slows the rate of decay down. It doesn't stop it. It will happen anyway in the end, but it slows it down long enough for you to be able to meet up again <laughs> from time to time. So, And of course, this is part and parcel of the complexity of friendships. It doesn't depend just on you. It's, it takes two to tango job. The other person has <laughs> to want to be your friend as well yeah. as you wanting to be their friend. Now, for them to make that decision means they maybe have to drop somebody else. You know, if you're a new person, friend, potential friend they've just met, to, to include you as a friend means they have to drop somebody else. Very harsh. <laughs> one in, one out. Indeed so. And it really is like that, it seems. And that makes it all the more imperative if you really want to have a particular person as a good friend to keep the relationship going or ticking over nicely by seeing them as often as you can because otherwise you risk the, the, the possibility that when you phone them up, well, they may be just too busy. Yeah. I think we've we all been once upon a time in such situation. I think the dare for this week for our listeners is definitely to reach out to your friends. Absolutely. Put that time, put that effort, because that's what builds the friendship and uh, ultimately leads to our happiness and we will live longer. I mean, what an amazing payoff. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> thank you so much, Robin. That was absolutely a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been great. Thank you, Robin, for inspiring us to look after our friendships, which clearly have these very crucial positive effects on our well-being. So this week, I dare you to, first of all, think about your shoulder to cry on type of friend and say thank you to them. Simply tell them how much they mean to you, especially when they are supporting you through difficult times. And if they have the same taste of music, send them a mixtape. <laughs> I know. Do you remember a mixtape? Oh. Anyway, think of one friend who you might have lost touch with. Reach out to them and say, hey, it has been a long time, but I am thinking of you. And three, unite your friends over dinner, activity, picnic, game, whatever you like. But as Robin stressed, to build a true connection, we need to be next to each other. 
If you have enjoyed this episode, do share it with your friends and remember to follow us on Instagram at and happiness official for some more tips and some of them actually coming from my upcoming book the alphabet of happiness so exciting and of course join me next time when we'll be speaking about grief and happiness how to manage our loss to reveal personal growth bye